What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. Welcome back to the channel. We have a familiar face across the screen for me. That beautiful maroon suit over there is enveloped by Dr. Jesse Morse's face of the Fantasy Doctors. He was a staple of the channel throughout last summer as well as uh, in season, you know, helping you guys out from a real medical standpoint when it comes to injuries. I know no one likes injuries, but they are one of the most underrated and most important parts of fantasy football, man. We talk about talent, we talk about opportunity, but health is up there, if not more so important with all the players that we factor in. So, you know, it's the off season, but we have plenty, plenty of players to talk about guys injured pre-draft, some rookies, some guys coming off of late injuries from last year, some guys that have just been injury prone over the last few seasons in general. So we are going to do our best to touch on, you know, the, uh, the the most key players right now in fantasy that you might be looking at in your startup drafts or might be targeting in season long. And I'm in the midst of doing a lot of my rankings videos right now, my early like top 20 for running back wide receivers. And I kind of cut off the wide receiver early because I was like, yeah, I don't really know if I feel comfortable kind of touching on all the top guys until I have real medical opinions on whether or not we can kind of trust them going into the year. So I thought this was a fantastic time to welcome uh, Dr. Morse onto the channel. So Dr. Morse, welcome bike. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome to have you back on here and I know you're going to provide a lot of value for us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, uh, starting to get the ball rolling. It looks like um, NFL is, is indeed going to be back after this crazy coronavirus. And then you throw in some crazy protesting that you, uh, you're, you're, you're in the heart of. Um, so it's, uh, I'm happy that we're going to get to actually hopefully see football and at least talk about it right now. Yeah. Can we actually talk about that for a minute? I know you're not like personally involved with everything that's going on with Corona because you deal with, you know, sports related injuries and things like that more so with the body physically with Corona though. I see a lot of tweets from, you know, physical trainers and stuff that do work with athletes. And they're saying that we've, we've all been on lockdown for two or three months. I mean, just as normal people, it's hard for us to stay motivated to work out, but these guys have to do it for a living and they have to mm -hmm. do at home workouts. Maybe some of them are privileged enough to have gyms in their houses or their apartments or whatever the case may be. But, you know, they're going to be laid off for a long time and they might get get back to training camp maybe within the month. But it's a very short window to prepare mm -hmm. physically for an NFL season as opposed to what we've seen over the last couple of years. So I know we didn't really put this on the show sheet, but I'd like to get your quick kind of reaction thoughts on how Corona will affect these these athletes bodies I also think it might actually open up like we might see guys who were second or third on the depth chart and when you come into camp and the, maybe the starters a little bit out of shape that guy stayed in shape like they can close the gap a little bit so this is without a doubt going to be a really really funky season what kind of effect do you see corona having on the overall impact yeah I think that this is going to be actually uh, under something that's underappreciated what's going to probably happen is you're going to have the guys that are just elite freaks and that stay in perfect shape year round and pretty good mm -hmm. then you'll have the guys that kind of took it a little bit relaxed and now are trying to ramp it back up but maybe their facilities aren't open or uh or it's just not available to them yet um and i think there'll definitely be some issues with uh injuries uh early on in camp with guys not being as fit as they want or not being able to work out like they are used to and now all of a sudden you're trying to turn it on um, you're probably going to see a decent amount of hamstring strains. That's pretty classic for early in the season. Uh, hopefully nothing has any uh, freak injuries like, you know, AJ uh, Green's injury, which we'll talk about a little bit, but that was early, you know, late July that kind of threw us all off. We may see some weird stuff like that. Um, but uh, the good news is that a lot of guys did have some downtime where they weren't as stressed and weren't as pressured to, to, to kind of continue to peak perform, which is good. They, that should allow them to kind of recharge. But I think there's definitely going to be some guys that are like, wait a minute, we didn't even think of drafting this guy. And now he's the starting running back uh, or whatever. Uh, I think that, that there's a very good chance that could happen. Uh, in, in terms of transmission of the actual virus, um, the good news is that um, – there, uh, the most of these guys are going to be playing outside, and 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 transmission outside is a lot uh, less uh, better, so to speak, a, a lot better than if you're in a, a subway car in, in New York or whatever, where everything's like a sardine can. Um, additionally, these guys are usually really high high level pro athletes, so they have really good conditioning, and and most of the time they'll be really well. You will have some issues. You guys got like Von Miller who who got it, and some of the NBA players, but. Uh, I think as the time goes on, we're, we're going to be able to, to uh, get people back in the stands and, and probably not have to worry about wearing masks as, as, as crazy. 
um, there may be some new data that, that came out this morning in Italy that this is starting to, to, to decrease and um, and it may uh, kind of fall off like SARS-1 did year, years ago. So yeah. that would be cool. I don't know if it's, it's the same as in America, but we'll see. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of different things that kind of unique situations that are going to present themselves. Um, but most of the guys were able to get their surgeries done and everything done uh, that they needed to get done, which is which is good. Yeah, I mean, it, the overall sense of things definitely is trending in an extremely positive direction as opposed to where it was just a month or two ago where we really it was a coin flip for any sort of sports happening within the next six months. But uh, the NFL has, has stayed steady with the fact that they think they're going to be playing the regular season uh, full go, obviously, without fans in the stands or at least a very, very limited uh, spectrum of that. But it feels, you know, it feels good as someone who, you know, runs a business primarily focused on fantasy and you're someone who uh, thrives via sports, especially building your personal brand. I mean, it's, it's, it's comforting for us, but these players have to deal with this stuff, especially, uh, especially the rookies, especially the guys coming in. It's their first year in the NFL, not having as much time to learn the playbook, not having as much time to get mm -hmm. chemistry with teammates and coaches and whatnot. Now, we know you're moving over to Miami, and we'll touch on that in a little bit, and you'll be able to expose as much info as you want. But we have another new face in Miami, and that is the face of the franchise in Tua Tagliavola. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to fuck that up for the rest of his career, so yeah, I apologize. We'll call him Tua. Tua is yeah, easy. We'll just call him TT. Tua, Tua T. Um, I'm going to put this on a T for you. I know you're concerned about Tua's health, the hip. I mean, not just the hip, but the entire history of his injury profile is is vast. It's deep. It's the Grand Canyon over here, as, as Dr. Morse would probably put it. We talked to you during the NFL Draft live stream. Now, Tua is like such a polarizing prospect, especially in like startup dynasty leagues where most of them are transitioning to super flex and he is a big target. Now, my, my question is, I guess, two parts. One, like how concerned really are you, Tua, over the long term? And two, like, do you think that they'll put Tua into the starting lineup in 2020? And if so, it's probably more like maybe halfway through the season, eight to six games or something like that, because they don't want a shitty offensive line to end up getting him hurt, right? No. Um, so in the long run, I am concerned about his longevity in terms of five plus years down the road. Okay. We know that he's elite. He's been elite pretty much his entire life. Uh, and my injury profiles go back from when they were kids, as far as like information as I can get. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a beast from the beginning. It was crazy. Um, but the problem is he's had some pretty significant injuries. Um, and, and some of the, the ways they proceeded with his care was very aggressive. The way they approached a lot of his care so if you get a high ankle sprain and you don't have a fracture, traditionally these guys take three, four weeks off like Kamara, Saquon last year, um, and they do really well. Tua undergoes surgery the next day, not once, but twice on each ankle. That's really aggressive. And probably a lot of that is probably because they wanted him to play in the next game. They're not going to do that in the NFL. The problem with a lot of his injuries seem to be that he thinks he's faster than he is and he thinks he escape, can escape the would-be tackler or sacker or whatever better than he can. So a lot of his injuries are them pulling him down from behind. You're, the, that was a, his, a couple of his knee injuries. That was his high ankle sprains. Um, he's had fractures. I mean, and, and then you really talk about his big injury. This injury, he probably shouldn't even have done on the field. Different discussion. But when you get sandwiched like this on both hips and your hip gets driven and, and, and the hip is a ball and socket joint. So around that socket, so you have bone, you have bone. And what happened with him was he pushed the bone through the back, broke that piece. And now the bone is dislocated behind his hip. So what happens is all of that cartilage was, was permanently damaged. It doesn't really come back. Um, they had to repair the, the actual bone, then they had to repair the cartilage or, or the labrum around it that keeps the bone in the socket. Some of this stuff is going to develop scar tissue. It's inevitable. There's nothing you can do about it. The question is, how long is that going to take? And um, how his, is his mobility going to be? That is where a lot of his stuff comes from. He can put passes on a dime. We know that. He's got a beautiful touch. He's got a fantastic strength. But he's going to be playing with some big boys uh, trying to get him every 
20 seconds, if he takes a couple big hits, is he going to suffer a new big injury? And then he's out for an extended period of time again. That's my big concern with him. And every uh, ortho surgeon that does hips I spoke with said, yeah, he's definitely going to have some issues. It just depends on how long and how bad uh, the arthritis and how bad the scar tissue is going to be uh, and how it affects him. So it, it may not be this year, but it's probably going to be a couple of years down the road. He, like, he just doesn't have that gear that you think he should have. That's, that's my issue with Tua. Okay, buyer beware if you are uh, on a tiebreaker on the clock, man. It might be might be wise to steer clear of Tua if you're if you're a long team preparing for the long haul because by the time he's in your lineup and making a difference, the injury could pop up. You heard it here first. Let's talk about Big Ben. I don't even know what's going on with Big Ben. He had the beard. He's <laughs> gone from the beard. They say he's thrown. He's got the elbow injury, which made him miss all of last year. Big Ben, it's not like so much people are excited about Big Ben returning, but everyone's so excited about what the Pittsburgh offense could be. They're so excited about Juju getting back to form. They're, they're excited about Deontay Johnson getting that breakout. They signed Eric Ebron, which, I mean, no one's really actually excited about. But, like, there's a lot in this offense. There's a lot of tools here that hinge on whether or not Ben Roethlisberger's elbow mm -hmm. falls off or not, right? So tell me a little bit about uh, Big Ben and your confidence level for him going into 2020. All right, so I give a injury risk scale on a scale of, of, of it's really one to 10. No one has zero risk. 10 being scary, I wouldn't even fathom touching them. Zero, one is like, don't, don't worry about it. They're good. Um, to give you an idea, Tua is 7.5. Wow, okay. Big Ben is 3.5. Okay, so low risk. He tried to throw a sidearm pass, and what happened was he – uh, tore his ulnar collateral, his, his, his pitching, his Tommy John ligament in his, in his elbow. Um, did he have Tommy John? Is that what he had? He did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so the data for football players who have had Tommy John is absolutely crazy because out of 7,168 games played between 1994 and 2008, only one quarterback ever had Tommy John. That's crazy. It just doesn't happen. It's a completely different throwing motion. The biomechanics are completely different. You're talking about different forearm positions, different wrist positions, which puts different stress on the elbow. The reason why Mahomes can get away with it, which he does a lot, you see him with these quick short arm passes right. when he's trying to get in between, is because he was a baseball player his whole life. I mean, he was that drafted. I mean, uh, so like uh, this is something that uh, Roethlisberger was just trying to do to, to get out of the way. Um, and unfortunately, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. The good news is that uh, once this ligament's good and, and refixed, re, uh, you know, reattached, uh, rebuilt, these guys are good to go. Uh, we, the reason why he had the beard, he says, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, shaving my beard until I can throw a pass to um, one of my wide receivers, like a real pass. Okay. And that's why he shaved it because he did. Um, so, and I was watching a video of him the other day doing it. So I think that uh, this offense really needs big Ben back. Uh, he's kind of underappreciated until you see how bad it was without him. Sure. I'm hoping Juju can bounce back. You know, we'll see what, uh, what Claypool can do. We'll see what uh, Washington and Deontay can do. Um, you know, we'll, Connor we'll, we'll talk about, but I'm not concerned about big Ben. I mean, yes, he gets his fair share of injuries. This was a fluky injury and right. I'm not worried about it at all. Okay. So you're not so much worried about, um, like not having any NFL data on the Tommy John surgery because we have so much data from baseball. And it's just, it was a fluke uh, thing that he's probably had some damage over the years. And this is just what pushed it over the edge. And you really need that ligament um, uh, in order to throw. I mean, it's more baseball throwing, but you still need it. And obviously he couldn't. Okay. So, you, so generally you're, um, you're feeling okay so about that. Yeah. I'm not worried. Okay, cool. So we have Tua. Yeah, I think he could be a great value. I mean, I, I, okay. So Ben, Ben is someone to, that we could target in, in 2020. That that actually is a pretty reassuring because I was I was definitely you know when when you get to these like older quarterbacks and you get to these older guys, they don't come back from injuries as quickly. But I guess the arm thing is a little bit different because it's not something that you're 
uh, you know, you're running on and you're using every moment of your day, especially if you're resting it, whereas opposed to something like Matt, St- Matt Stafford. I'm someone who's been widely way more worried about him than the rest of the industry and people that are drafting in 2020. Apparently, Matt Stafford is the best value quarterback in fantasy football right now because the pace that he started off with last year. And I'm like, yo, this guy is kind of old. I know he's not old compared to Brady. We've gotten spoiled with that old age kind of thing. But not every quarterback is going to get there. And when you're 33, 34, 35, mm-hmm. or whatever, you're, you're, you're old compared to the, the, the athletes that you're playing against. And Matt Stafford's had these, what I consider to be, and maybe I'm just fucking being an idiot here, but serious back injuries in both of the last two years. So you tell me, like, is, is there a real injury concern here for Matt Stafford with this back? So, yeah, uh, Stafford, he's actually my injury profile sample. You can check out my full profile of him on my there's – there's a link to it on my pinned tweet if you want to see it. Okay. Um, he's 32, so it feels like he's been around forever, but he's 32. Um, he's had some injuries, man, uh, but he was a warrior. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do Matt Stafford, um, Derek Carr, Cam Newton, and Tony Romo all have in common besides all being NFL quarterbacks? They all suffered significant fractures in the back and all of them returned to play Stafford will when he gets back. So stat uh, Romo's injury that ended his career was different than the one that he allowed to come back from Um, Derek Carr. While he's not amazing, he still came back from the injury and cam while he's been banged up and is being banged up. He came back. So the good news is that this injury um, was serious enough to shut him down but is not serious enough to continue to linger. Um, and he, everything you said about him having a fantastic beginning of the season is true. I mean, um, he was at 64.3% of his passes. Um, you know, he, he has some tools and we know he has, uh, you know, he's got Hawkinson still there. Carry on is what he is. He's got Swift, you know, he's got uh, Galladay. He's got um, grandpa Marvin. Uh, so he's got toys. He's got options. Um, and, 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 and he's actually got a decent line, um, 11th in the NFL in line. Um, so, like, the good news is that he's had 10 months to heal. He, uh, he's, he's had time to strengthen his core. He's had time to get back and, and, and be mobile. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a good chance uh, he rocks and rolls like nothing ever happened because uh, once these fractures heal and, and the muscles that attach to those uh, bones heal uh, and, and re-strengthen, you rock and roll. This is not a, a spinal injury per se. This is a small process off of the, uh, off of one of the, some of the vertebrae that happened to break off and that's where muscles attach to. So it's a little, you got to wait for that to heal before you can kind of go back to normal. If he, if it was only one level, he probably would have came back in two, three weeks. I think that's what Carr had, but I think uh, we don't know exactly, but I think Stafford's was probably two, three or four levels. So at that point, that that's a lot of space to cover. Whereas it's just one level. Most of these guys can come back. No big deal. So I actually like uh, uh, Stafford. I think he's, he's pretty low risk. Uh, I, I gave him a two out of 10 to give you an idea of like how risky he is. Like I just, okay. I'm not worried about him at all. This was a fluky injury and it, it happens. I mean, it happened to all these other guys too. Okay. So that's why you don't listen to Dr. Nick. You listen to Dr. Morris. That's why we bring him on the channel here and all my talk about bike to bike, broken bikes throw it out the window. We are not concerned about Matt Stafford. So about some running backs who we had a lot of concern about last year and we will probably <laughs> not all back fractures are created equal. Not, let me tell you. not all bike fractures are created equal here. So Todd Gurley, the 25 year old with the 50 year old knee. Now for the most part, he outperformed expectations last year. I think by the time the season happened, no one expected him to be, you know, a top three running back like he had been signs this contract with the Falcons that would make 2017 Todd Gurley slapped himself right in the face. It's a one-year, $5 million deal. If that team signs a 25-year-old running back to that type of deal, I mean, that I feel like speaks volumes enough, especially the fact that uh, with the depth that they have there, I mean, you think they would have given him a longer-term contract if they thought he was part of the longer-term plans. What was ridiculous to me was that their, their front office came out and there was a quote, and I'll put it up on the screen, it was like, you know, the, the question at hand here is not Todd Gurley, but it's what is the status of his health? How do you sign a guy whose knee is notoriously known at this point for not being 100 percent 
sign him and then say some shit like, oh, well, we don't actually know what's up with the knee. After he played a full 16 games last year, like, I, it, it was just a very weird, like, conflicting thing to say from the Falcons' front office. So you were uh, very much on record last year about, you know, being uh, nervous about Gurley's knee. And, like, clearly the Rams felt the same way because they didn't run him the same way that they did the previous two years. But now on the Falcons, people are like, oh, it's his backfield to lose. He's going to get a billion touches. Like, what are we feeling about this year? Is it any different than last year? Do you think he can handle 15 to 20 touches and be the guy? So, so here's the thing. The good thing about Gurley, he managed to play a whole season pretty much. He had a small uh, tweak in his quad uh, bruise strain, and he missed one game. So he played 15 of 16, and he probably could have played that one, whatever. Uh, those are usually aren't that big of a deal. If you see any of the videos of him rehabbing recently, he's doing jump cuts. He's doing single leg leg presses at 460 pounds or whatever it is. Right. Uh, not exactly perfect form, but you know, a bit, it'd be able to, the fact that he can do it is good. So the thing with Gurley in 2020 is going to be all about expectations. So right. you can't expect 2017, 2018 Todd Gurley. He's gone. He's never coming back. He's on a milk box somewhere because um, his knee is not going to be able to condone that. And he knows that. And you can rehab until he's blue in the face, and he is. Um, but his knee just doesn't have that luxury anymore. The ACL tear years ago, probably with a large meniscal tear and, and some of the other injuries, and then early at onset arthritis, because of those injuries, just he's not able to get the same burst, same explosiveness, and be able to recover you know, week in and week out over the course of a, a grueling season to be able to ask his body to do that. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, it was not in their best interest, the, the Rams' interest, to, to to continue to pay him. I mean, think about think about it. They had they they lost twenty five million dollars worth of dead cap space by cutting. Yeah, they're like, they're in like the worst cap space situation ever, bro. Yeah, I mean, but that, but but I get it because like you want your other guys. I mean, if you're paying them that much, you kind of have to play them. But it, it's it's counterproductive to play him because he's not probably your best back, or you know maybe he is, but but you want your younger guys who you're not paying much um, comparatively. Uh, so uh, they signed him for you know the 2017 2018 Todd Gurley, and then they get this new version who. Is, is 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 worth what five million if you're if you're lucky maybe he gets five yeah. or three and a half or whatever but um you know maybe maybe up to eight or nine whatever whatever the incentives are but um so the good thing is that our expectations should be less for Gurley his price is going to be less which is going to be helpful um I'm hoping that he he's got a bunch of different treatments this offseason PRP bone bone marrow amniotic a bunch of stuff that I'll be doing in Miami um all of this stuff. Uh, can be helpful working with the right trainers, doing the right exercises and continuing to, to challenge that knee and have it uh, be as strong as it can possibly be. So unfortunately, uh, his offensive line in, in LA killed him. And, and, and that, I mean, 3.8 yards per carry, 57 yards a game. If he didn't score 12 touchdowns, he would have been awful. He would yeah, have well, been. I got, I got news for everybody out there. Unfortunately, they're getting excited about the opportunity in Atlanta. I'm here to tell you as an Atlanta fan, the line over there ain't much better. There's a reason why Devontae Freeman was awful last year outside of pass catching. Dirk Cutter is basically incapable of running uh, an offense that has a, a, as a plus run game. You look back at Gurley, I mean, uh, like like you said, he's not the guy he was. In, in 2017, 2018, he combined for 14 games of over 100 rushing yards. Last year, zero. Three yeah. out of the 15 games, he had over 4.4 yards per carry. Otherwise, 12 of the games, he had under 4.4 yards per carry. So he was almost a detriment to the team on the ground. And now he's coming over Atlanta where, yes, the opportunity is there. But this is not a case where I just want to say opportunity is king and feel good about it. Like, for Gurley, where, where are you comfortable with him being in your lineup? The opportunity, again, is there. But, like, do you want – are you okay with him as your RB2? I'd prefer if he was a flex, but I don't yeah. know if he'll have that luxury. Yeah, I'm not – if I have to draft him as my RB2, which is probably, like, round four, he's not going to end up on my team. If he drops to, like I, – I honestly, personally, probably won't have him in my rankings until it's around round six or seven. And even then – I just tend to steer clear of those guys who I just, you know, I just don't want on my team. No matter, like, there's value and then there's just players I want. And I tend to just draft the players I want over guys that are perceived value because at the end of the day, value is just ADP made up by people that play fantasy football. So it's not a real thing. It's just how people perceive a player to be. And 
for Gurley, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, man. Like, he needs to be a flex play if he's going to end up on my team. So currently, Gurley is going at the 28th pick, fourth pick in the third round. Where? Right uh, after Fournette. Side? This is on Fantasy Football Calculator on uh, 12-team PPR. Yeah, that, that calculator is kind of trash. But I honestly, like, on, I'll go over to Fantasy Mojo, and they use, um, like, real money leagues ADP. And honestly, Gurley is probably – not like too too far off there. I'm sure he's a little bit lower, but uh, Gurley, holy shit! Yep, he's the RB16 right now, 27th overall. I, I, it, whew, I, I would rather. I, I could say a lot of bad things right now that I would rather do over having Todd Gurley as my early third round pick. But case in point here, yeah, I mean, there's still there's still concerns to be had about the injury. The Falcons themselves have concerns about the injury. Uh, they signed him to a low contract. He's just not a guy that you can project to hit that ceiling type of play. And if I'm drafting a guy within the first few rounds, I want him to be I, generally much more risk averse in the early rounds because those guys are going to be the foundation and the core of your team for the, for the entirety of the season. So, Gurley, we're nervous about. Let's talk about Chris Carson because this entire backfield is one to pretty much be nervous about. He's coming off of, I believe, a hip fracture. Now he has his teammate Rashad Penny who's going to start on the pup with that late season torn ACL. He's probably going to end up missing more than just the first six games of being on the pup. I'd assume he's going to miss, you know, maybe eight games, ten games, whatever. By the time he's actually an impact in fantasy, it'll be late into the season. It won't matter. So Rashad Penny's out. They sign Carlos Hyde who at this point is just a redundant, worse athletic version of Chris Carson in my opinion. Chris Carson, like – the opportunity was so grand for him last year, and he doesn't have much Beautiful. much to compete with. Like, I like the rookie that they brought in, DJ Dallas, but I don't think he's anywhere near the talent that Chris Carson is. How confident are you in Chris Carson's ability to stay on the field just via injuries because he's had a long line of injuries and now coming off – like, th let's talk about this, this most recent injury. Are we concerned that that's going to affect him in 2020? So, uh, he was having a good season. Real good. He was having a really good season. Um, I mean, remember he had an ankle fracture a couple of years ago and then he came back and, and you rock and roll. Yep. The ankle's different than the, the knee though. The ankle usually does quite well. He actually led the, the, uh, in 2018, he led this, the NFL with broken tackles of 39. So he came back hard. Um, then he had knee surgery in May of last year. Um, probably a meniscal tear. They didn't say, but that's usually what they do that for. Right. Um, and then he had a great season. Unfortunately, he had this fracture. Um, here's the thing. They literally have said nothing about this fracture. All they said was that he did not have surgery. That's very important because there's not many fractures in the hip, unlike Tua, um, that don't have surgery. So my suspicion is he actually had a stress fracture in the, uh, so you have the ball and socket. Well, before the ball, you have the neck and that's likely where he had a stress fracture. So there's two parts to the neck. One part uh, have to have surgery. It's very high risk if they don't. The other part, you can get away with conservative treatment. That's okay. almost where he had to have had it. Anywhere else um, in, in the hip, if it's a fracture, you have surgery. That's just what you do because you, you're, you're putting too much risk <clears throat> to not have surgery because then you're just going to do it again. So um, this is um, – concerning to the point where um, I don't think he's going to be able to handle the same workload. Uh, they need to monitor for what they call avascular necrosis, which means that the, the blood flow to the, to the ball uh, starts to deteriorate and the ball starts to crumble. Um, and then eventually you need a hip replacement, kind of like Bo Jackson. Uh, so not pretty. Um, the issue is uh, they don't really have anybody else, you, you said, and, and I agree with um, Hyde is what he is. Penny probably won't be back. Dallas is what he is. I don't even know if Homer's still on the roster. Um, he is. Uh, you know, so, I mean, the offensive line still is not very good. Um, they, they have plenty of weapons, but they love to run the ball. I'm just torn over him this year. Two big fractures, three years. Um, the volume's probably going to drop. Um, I, is, I honestly out. think as long as as long as he's on the field, every time he started the game as the starter, they fed him 20 touches. Like they don't care if he's on the field or not on the field. As long as he's not hurt, they're gonna give him 20 touches. So like, what's your say? We go into the season. Chris Carson is the starting running back week one for Seattle, and they're gonna give him 20 touches a game. What's your confidence level? He plays in more than like 12 games. 50 percent. 
50 percent. okay so he's, yeah, he's probably mean, a guy worth investing in in like one of your leagues maybe but not going all in on at the value i have some hesitation he needs to control his fumbling too yeah. and don't forget that if you no, had him on your team last year and you fumble you're like oh god is he gonna go back in or do i yeah. start him next week with what happens um so if you can catch him at the end of around like the end of the, like the the 12 uh, 10 to 12 running back range maybe he's worth it you know 14 range I probably wouldn't reach for him yeah. because I think guys have higher upside um, and have less competition. You know, uh, and when you're talking about guys like CEH, um, you're talking about uh, guys uh, who have a lot more upside and don't have this injury risk. I think that, that that's probably a better way to go, even though we love Carson's running style. We love their uh, the way that they run their offense through him. I'm just a little concerned about him. My risk for him scores a seven out of 10. So it's pretty high. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I imagine. I mean, the next few guys I'd imagine are probably in the same case. And you tweeted something out about James Conner. You gave a little, a little uh, glimpse of it on Twitter to us. And if you're not following Dr. Morris on Twitter, make sure you do so. His link will be right in the description as well as probably on the screen already. James Conner, uh, we talked about Big Ben, and the reason we want a Big Ben back on the field is because we've always had a prolific fantasy running back in Pittsburgh's backfield. But Connor has not been able to stay healthy like ever. He dealt with 32 different injuries last year. They draft this kid, Anthony McFarland, in the fourth round out of Maryland, who I personally love as a prospect. And uh, I think he brings a piece of this offense, explosion, just burst home run speed that no one else on the team or no one else in the backfield, I should say, provides. So I see like Connor, even if he does stay healthy, which I feel like you're not going <laughs> to tell me that he is going to stay healthy. McFarland is going to take away some of those chunk plays that Connor might have had. And they have a lot of guys in the backfield that just like kind of do the same thing. So I don't know where the volume is going to be at, but like with James Connor, I mean, the, the diversity of injuries he's dealt with, and it's been three years now, every year he's been in the NFL, like the confidence level on him has to be at an all time low, right? Yeah, so here's the issue with Connor. So, got a great story. If you haven't watched his video and, yeah. and his story, I mean, it, it's a great story, but he just can't seem to, to stay healthy. I mean, he had significant uh, knee injury in college, MCL tear, uh, ended up um, uh, having surgery on it on his way back. Uh, they ended up finding he had, uh, he had cancer and lymphoma, so then he had to go back from that. Then he had another injury. Then he's had a high ankle sprain. He had his concussion. And then this past year, in week three, he had a knee injury. In week four, he had an ankle injury. In week seven, he had a quad injury. Then week eight, he sprains his shoulder, misses week nine and 10, meaning he came back too early. He returned in week 11 only to re-injure it. Then he misses week 12, 13, and 14. He comes back and makes, misses week 17 with a quad injury. So it's like – Not good. Uh, what – when, when are you going to get him on the field? I mean, um, we saw pictures of him recently looking like a monster. I mean, I don't know if you, if you happened to catch his back. The back was he pretty impressive. A, oh, my God. It was – the pipes were impressive. But that doesn't always correlate to effectiveness in the field, unfortunately. Right. But um, so the injury history is there. Um, I probably wouldn't reach for him based on probably where he's going. Uh, I'd probably rather have someone safer, even though he has a ton of upside. Um, I just, it's hard to trust him. Yeah. It's hard to trust him. That's the issue. You know, those injuries start to add up that that knee is never going to be a hundred percent. He's getting some of these Nicky knack injuries that the, the shoulder injury was fluky, but he didn't, he, he didn't give it appropriate amount of time. And as a result, he re-injured it and missed another three, four weeks. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, he's just not a guy that I see, the guy was arguing with us about, uh, you know, a dynasty pick. And they're like, well, I'm, t I'm targeting Connor in the sixth round every time. And I'm just like, I don't want to draft guys, one, who's probably going to be off the Steelers next year. Like, he's not going to get a contract extension. Clearly, they don't trust him to be the guy there. He's dealt with too many injuries. It's just like, it, at best case scenario, he stays healthy for like 15 games this year. You get one solid season out of him. And then it's not like another team's about to give him, you know, three for 30 or something on a contract and become the guy. So, like, Connor's a guy that I'm – completely off of when we come to dynasty redraft again i guess like a carson he's like a worse version of carson where you could roll the dice on him if you want but their injury risk is, is extremely high there and same thing with dalvin cook he's a guy you have to invest heavy heavy draft capital into just absolute monster year you called that he was your breakout player of the year for 2019 i remember you were super hyped about him starting in like all the way in march 
you did end up disappointing fantasy owners at the end of the season. He got you to the championship, but he couldn't close the deal for you. Mm -hmm. And for him, this is another uh, thing like Connor where it's a running theme. He he's missed games year in and year out. So super high on him last year. Are you at the same level of excitement for cook knowing that you have to invest basically, you know, the number five overall pick in him in redraft leagues this year, or is, you know, is, is it not worth it because the floor is a lot lower than guys like Ezekiel Elliott, who's, you know, we we pretty much know is going to stay on the field, you know? So I think he needs to be in the top six backs. Mm -hmm. He's probably the riskiest of all of them. The talent's there. We know that. CMC is in a class of his own until he proves otherwise. Zeke continues to underrate. He's that boring pick that continues right. to deliver. So, yeah. um, and then you have, you know, boom and bust guys, your, your Saquons, your Camaras, um, you know, uh, Derrick Henry, uh, Mixon, uh, that, those, Aaron Jones, those guys that mm, maybe top five, maybe they fall out. Uh, we don't know. But, but Cook, <coughs> he came back from his ACL strong in his second year, which is what I was expecting. Looked right. fantastic. They love running the ball. They have one less pass catcher in Diggs who's gone. Um, they love to run the ball. He suffered this fluke injury where he tweaked his shoulder and then he tweaked his SC joint, his, his, his sternocleidal joint. Um, and he ended up, as a result, kind of um, having some issues just being able to stay on the field. Um, but the when thing with miss Cook, though, it's like, you know, he, he, he suffers. It's like fluke injury after fluke after fluke after fluke. And at what point do you say, OK, the gathering of fluky is eventually not fluky anymore? Right. That's the question at hand. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you've got to remember that he had two, most people don't remember this, but he had two shoulder surgeries in college. Okay. So he actually slipped and tried to break his fall and tore his labrum in college. And he ended up having two, two different injuries and two right. different surgeries. I forgot as a result. about that, actually. So like, and this is, that was completely different than, than this injury, obviously. Um, and then you, then you talk about the ACL and then he had a couple of hamstring injuries and, you know, so it's like, at what cost, you know, uh, at 3.06 uh, yards uh, after contact per attempt, you know, he's one of uh, seven running backs in 2019 to uh, break over 60 tackles. Like the data's there, uh, but can he stay healthy? If, if I have to take him in the four to six, seven range, I probably will. Um, but I probably wouldn't take him one, two or three. Okay. If yeah, I had so a choice, regardless of what you know, uh, what the what the format is, it's it's almost like we expect him to kind of reproduce what he did last year. Like probably going to expect fourteen games, but a fucking really really good run of fourteen games from him, right? Yeah, I mean he what he go he went two fifty, uh, uh, one thousand uh, one hundred thirty five, thirteen rushing touchdowns, and then he caught fifty three passes for five hundred and basically twenty yards. Yeah, he they, was only you know you know like they keep building the offense by paying all the passers and the pass catchers, and then everything runs through Dalvin Cook, which is you know funny, ironic. Maybe they extend him, maybe they don't, but it's clear that you know with Zimmer there, they just want to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and Cook is such a good pass catcher that his ceiling is just so exponential and he was breaking out for big runs last year he was scoring like 13 rushing touchdowns on the goal line he was absolute monster so ceiling is obviously there I'm I'm of the belief now that he's probably at the the back end of that first tier like I would put all the elite guys up there you know the C-Max uh the Saquons the Zeke Elliott's the Alvin Kamara's and stuff and then Dalvin would probably be the last guy in there just because I mean it, I don't know. The injury concern is absolutely there. Again, I try to be a little bit more risk averse in the early rounds. Um, I would just prefer a guy like Zeke, who you probably are going to get to pick between the two, knowing that he's going to stay on the field for the entirety of the season. Now, we would love to get anything near the entirety of the season from a guy like Darius Geis. One of the more polarizing prospects from the running back position to come out in quite some time. But now it's beginning to feel a little fuzzy just how long ago that was. It feels like he's been in the NFL for so long. The guy just keeps re-injuring himself. Uh, going forward, like, is this a situation where you're looking at the Dalvin Cooks and you're like, oh, it's – I can't say fluky because they've been very serious injuries. But someone put it on a podcast the other day. It, does he just keep rolling double snake eyes? Or are these, like, very intertwined with each other and we should be very nervous about him going forward? Like, does the guy just have super weak knees? No, I think uh, it's a combination of the two. I think it's his combination of his running style and the fact that his, the knees don't heal as much as you'd like him to, and he okay. doesn't have that rare freak genetic gene like like Adrian Peterson seems to have. Um, like 
uh, he, he had a knee sprain in 17 and the left knee, then in the left knee again, he tears his ACL. And the ACL is what it is. Um, right. Calvin Cook had an ACL. A lot of these guys have ACLs. The problem with it is he had an infection. He had an infection that required four surgeries to fix that. So that always makes me question the quality of the graft, the quality of the knee afterward. You know, then um, he, he tweaks his hamstring last preseason or offseason, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then what does he do? He tweaks, his, he tears his meniscus and he misses nine games on the other knee. So now we're talking about two bad knees. Mm -hmm. you know and, and then he comes in and he tweaks his mcl on his left knee again so he's got a left knee acl uh, reconstruction he's got a left knee mcl sprain he's got a right knee mcl or, or, or meniscal tear i mean he's starting to run out of knees here um, <laughs> and with his with his aggressive running style if if he's healthy we know he's a home run the kid has he's impressive he just hasn't been able to stay healthy and i don't want to I, one of the things I like to say is don't draft guys who get in, who are have injuries. Don't draft injuries. They will find you. So why are you going to draft a guy who already has a mag huge injury history? Uh, and then maybe your second or third round pick ends up getting an injury. That's not traditionally injury prone. Right. And then you're like, all right, now half my team, my major guys are all, uh, you know, injured or on the IR or whatever. So it's like, I avoid injuries when I can, and he's on, he's one of those guys that I just have no interest in because I can't trust him. And if I can't trust him, what good is it? Yeah, the upside is just so enticing and appetizing because you want to be like, oh, he's going to be a top seven running back if he ever puts it together. It's just getting to the point where you have no confidence that he will put it together. The team just keeps signing more and more running backs, pass catchers. So, like, even if he does stay healthy, does he get a three-down load? Probably not. I mean, this is a team that's going to be trailing a lot, and they have mm -hmm. they brought in J.D. McKissick. I mean, they re-signed uh, Adrian Peterson. They brought in a bunch of other, like, fat running backs. But Bryce Love's still there. Remember his Bryce ACL? Love is going to be coming back off his injury. Yeah, so, I mean, there's just, there's just so many red flags. So, throw anything other than probably, like, a double-digit – dart at Darius Geis at least for redraft leagues I think would probably be a little bit irresponsible so you're you're yeah you're overreaching yeah he's exactly gonna, he's not going to be he's unlikely to in my opinion it's all about value and you're, you're not going to get value if you reach for him apologies for the quick cutoff despite popular belief Dr. Morse is actually a, a real doctor he actually has patience to deal with and see and whatnot and he had one and the internet kind of started chopping up so I said doctor Doc, Morse, we love you here. Go fix the world. I'll go fix these idiots that actually listen to me and us with a little bit of an outro. So uh, thank you all for sticking along, uh, around for this long. Of course, I'm kidding. You're not idiots. You're just morons. But for real, that was the quarterback running back episode. Next Thursday, we will have Dr. Morse back on to discuss wide receivers as well as injured tight ends. Uh, so y'all could look forward to that. We do have a cool announcement, though. Dr. Morse works extremely, extremely hard during the offseason on an entire injury guide. So he goes really, really in-depth on any fantasy player that you could possibly think of that might come into the season as a, as a possible injury risk or injury-prone player. That will be included in our draft guide. It's also, so you could get it in a few different ways. If you purchase the Big Dog Draft Guide, that will be included in it, which is a, an extremely cool perk uh, that I think a lot of you guys enjoy when you purchase the draft guide. Y'all can find that on bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you are in a state that is eligible to play uh, any of the daily fantasy games, then you can cop it through our sponsor of the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKS. F for 10 bucks you get the season long the rookie the dynasty as well as getting to play some games on monkey knife fight play a two dollar game on there when you sign up through that link and you will get access to all the draft guides the injury draft guide included or you could just say fuck big dogs we don't want their draft guide we just want dr morse's shit which honestly I, I really wouldn't blame you for it he has his injury profile his entire injury draft guide is available on his patreon he also does just individual players of so if you don't want to cop the whole thing you could do individual players of certain guys that you were curious about obviously for a much lower price so i will link the patreon down below i will also put the link for the draft guide for monkey knife fight down below everything we talked about will be linked down below so i hope you all enjoyed hit that thumbs up button if you did subscribe to the channel if you're new dr morse will be on with us most likely throughout the year every single week to discuss the injured players of the yester week and whatnot i love y'all i'm out <laughs>